Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to ARC's second crypto brainstorm. My name is Yassine Almandra. I lead crypto at ARC. Alongside me is ARC CEO, Kathy Wood. And we are thrilled to be joined by quite the special group of guests today. Uh, there's never a dull moment in crypto, but I think the last month has been unprecedented in many ways. After a year of contagion, bankruptcies, and collapses, crypto appears to be positively responding to a global banking crisis. And at the same time, U.S. regulators are escalating their negative stance on crypto in what appears to be uh, an outright coordinated attack. Uh, I think we're really living in quite quite the historic time now in crypto, and we thought it would be uh, uh, great to bring together a, a group of some of the most respected operators and investors in the space for uh, an open conversation about uh, the current state of the market. I think this is particularly exciting because each of these panelists comes with a very unique lens. Uh, Lynn Alden, as a macro investor with a deep understanding of Bitcoin, has been really leading the conversation on this regional banking crisis and the Fed's decision-making in the context of Bitcoin. Uh, Jeremy Allaire, as the CEO of the largest regulated stablecoin issuer in the world circle, has been you know, successfully navigating this banking crisis and, and showing a continued commitment to uh, openness and transparency. Paul Graywall, uh, as the chief legal officer at Coinbase, has been at the forefront pushing for uh, greater regulatory clarity in, in the US and emphasizing the importance of uh, fostering an environment for crypto to flourish in the US. Uh, Caitlin Long, as the CEO of the founder and founder of Custodia Bank, uh, continues to, to fight to build a regulatory compliant bridge between the traditional U.S. financial system uh, and crypto assets. Angie Dalton, as the CEO of uh, Signum Capital, ha has built a really strong relationship with uh, U.S. regulators working with startups and protocols to outline a, a regulatory compliant path to operate in the U.S. Uh, Chris Berniski, partner at Placeholder Ventures and a longtime crypto investors, has done an awesome job just highlighting the resilience of uh, crypto fundamentals and why, despite this uncertainty, it's quite the compelling time to, to be an investor. And finally, Michael Sunshine, uh, as CEO of Grayscale, uh, the manager of the largest OTC product tracking Bitcoin's price and GBTC, ha has been trailblazing the path to a U.S. Bitcoin ETF approval uh, and rightfully questioning some of the assumptions the SEC has made in its decision making. Uh, so this should be a fun one. Uh, this is hopefully the most talking I'm going to do uh, through this entire conversation. Uh, but thank you everyone for being here. And uh, without further ado, let's, let's dive right in. Uh, I think it probably makes sense to start with uh, what's top in, on, in mind for everyone. And that's really the regulatory climate uh, and the U.S.'s evolving stance on crypto. Uh, there really appears to be this growing dark cloud on regulation in the U.S. after FTX's collapse. Uh, and now that really appears to be accelerating um, with the, the collapse of, of Signature Bank, of Silvergate. Uh, we got a Wells notice from Coinbase, uh, rejection in, in Custodia Bank. Uh, and so, you know, what do we make of all this? Perhaps we can start with you, Paul. Um, how is this regulator landscape shifting? What do you make of the current state of regulation in the U.S.? Well, thank you, Yasin, and thank you, Kathy. Um, what I make of it is that the United States um, is in a very precarious position uh, as we look out 
uh, across the, the regulatory landscape, not just um, here in the United States, but a- around the world. And I think to understand that, it's important to understand not only what's happening with the SEC, what's happening with uh, the Treasury Department, um, and what's happening at the state level, but also to compare and contrast that with what we're seeing uh, in jurisdictions outside the United States and all over the world. Um, th- the reality is that even as we continue to uh, struggle to have basic rules here in the United States governing crypto, a basic framework that, for example, defines what is a security, what is a commodity, what is a currency, uh, other nations, other jurisdictions are pushing ahead and doing so uh, in a very productive way without sacrificing their own commitments to investor protection, consumer protection, and the like but in a way that is also focused on promoting innovation, promoting capital formation, and creating a climate of certainty and stability that will naturally uh, attract capital and attract developer interest. Just to give you a a sense of how different the situation is here in the United States from uh, other countries all over the world. Right now, we're seeing just in the last uh, few years, the US's global share of Web3 developers plummeting. Um, it's now down to less than 30%, uh, percent, and there's no signs that it's slowing down. We're also seeing jurisdictions like Hong Kong um, uh, and the UK and Australia, and I could go down a long list, all adopting um, reasonable frameworks for, for regulation. And just as importantly, signaling clearly to the rest of the world, including to developers and innovators here in the United States, that we want you. We want to help you build. We want to provide that clarity and certainty that you need in order to be able to build. And we're going to work with you in a way that you're not experiencing in the United States, either at the federal or in many cases at the state level. So um, I do think that it is, it is a pivotal moment for us here in the U.S. I think as a country, we're going to have to decide, is this an industry? Is this an innovation that we want to continue to lead? Or are we going to simply cede that ground out of some misguided um, uh, attempt to uh, 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 address uh, uh, abuses um, in crypto with tools that um, actually have far more consequential impacts uh, uh, than, than I think anyone fully appreciates? So, Paul, I'd love to to I'd love um, to know from you and from uh, the other panelists. Do you think there is sort of a higher level reason for all of this regulatory pushback? Is this coming from on high? The U.S. is the the U.S. is the reserve currency of the world, and could there be a fear of you know losing that status or even a fear of capital flight in some sense? Well, there's no question that the consequences, I think, could be as, as, as dire, Kathy, as you're suggesting. As for where it's coming from, I do think it's important to be um, thoughtful and selective in understanding the different types of regulatory pressure that we're facing here in the United States. For example, I would distinguish between um, the clear coordination that we're seeing in denying basic banking services to crypto firms, uh, big and small established and and, and innovative here in the United States. That is, I think, all but uh, operating in plain sight. If you look at the statements uh, coming from the from the White House and and elsewhere uh, on on that very specific issue, I think separate and apart from the banking question, uh, we're seeing um, the SEC uh, and others uh, undertake their own efforts to um, assert jurisdiction and grab control of the primary role in regulating crypto in the U.S. I don't know that that's as much a, a reflection of deep coordination as it is jurisdictional uh, primacy and a fight to establish one agency as the primary regulator over all others. I think one one thing I can add from a historical perspective is that if you look back at the war era from World War One, World War Two, there was a lot of increased capital controls and increased kind of national security interest in preventing the easy flow um, of capital across borders and things like that. And as we see geopolitics obviously heat up, and uh, we see um, you know the the unipolar world we've been in for the past thirty years kind of divide into two or more poles in the world. There's obviously a lot more focus on blocking those those borders. 
Um, and so I think that's that's kind of one way to look at it from a strategic perspective. And you know, when you look back also at, at periods of time where you know large developed countries have very very high debt burdens, they're often stuck in a position where you know they're they're running large fiscal deficits. They have very large debts. If they have positive real interest rates, then they have trouble servicing those debts over the long course. And so a lot of capital flight wants to go out into harder assets, and then they end up trying to to slow that flow in various ways. Uh, so I think that's that's one kind of like um you know very long term macro strategic thing to be aware of. And then of course you have on top of that the more securities investor uh, protection focused thing, which I think is. It's obviously overlapping in many ways, but it is somewhat of a different focus. I mean, you know, the same invention that allows for peer-to-peer -peer money now kind of allows for peer-to-peer -peer securities in a way. And so, you know, it used to be that, you know, to, to launch something like a security, it was an expensive process. And now the technology makes it easier and it's kind of butting up against those those existing securities laws. And so it reopens questions like, what is a security? How can we, how can we uh, you know, protect investors while, while, you know, maybe streamlining the process and, and you know, updating realizing that technology is different now, things can come to market faster, things are more automated, less overhead. So I, I kind of put this whole thing in almost two separate buckets, even though they, they do obviously have some degree of overlap in the middle. I would jump into just laddering off of what Lynn shared, which is, I mean, I, I think it varies around the world, but certainly here in the United States, I think there's, there's frankly just a lot of laziness in not wanting to do the work of understanding what this technology is, how it functions, and, and how it's different. There's, there's, you know, this, for years and years and years, it's been the square peg round hole issue, which is, you know, a, a everything is a security or everything is a commodity. Um, and, you know, we have this world where, you know, you, you have uh, these, these instruments, uh, sometimes they're financial instruments, sometimes they're technological instruments, Sometimes they're providing a technical service. Sometimes they're they're fulfilling you know s some other purpose, and it's kind of um, I don't know if the the right metaphor, the Heisenberg principle of like what what state is this thing in um, a as you interact with it. It's a very real thing, and so like the hard work is doing the work to to do the statutory definitions of digital assets, and to actually understand. What are these? How do we think about these? How do we how do how do we think about the interaction that people have with them? And then you know, using a kind of principles based approach, being able to sort of say, you know, we care about financial crime over here, or we care about investor protection here. Um, but you know, I, I think this is not just in the United States because I think that the, there are other jurisdictions that are that are guilty of this. But I think there's just a desire to say we've got 80 years of regulations on the books, and we just have to figure out how they apply. And as we know with exponential technologies, that just doesn't work. I mean, look what's happening with AI right now. There is no rule book uh, that one can turn to or flying cars or whatever the exponential tech is. It's just, you, you can't do that. And so it's in, in, my, in my belief, you have these very large institutional structures, these deep institutional structures that are incentivized to kind of maintain their existing kind of frameworks of of supervision and and um, and it, it, it's a lot of inertia, and so and you have a political environment where the current administration um, is, you know, I think fairly anti-technology, in in many cases, anti-financial innovation, in many cases, uh, and um, you know I, I think it has its priorities wrong. <laughs> I mean, basically, and, and so I think a lot of those things kind of com combine um, uh, to to make this you know, make this a really challenging environment here in the U.S. You know, bringing together some of the things that some of the other panelists have said, there are questions about American competitiveness and a lot of the innovation here going to other jurisdictions. And, you know, whether it's laziness, as Jeremy said, or just a, perhaps a lack of engagement or fundamental understanding of these technologies and the ever-evolving use cases surrounding them, Regardless, I think we'd all agree that the approach here in the U.S. has largely been flawed. Um, you know, I've been in the crypto space now for over nine years, and by my count, there have been over a hundred, well more than a hundred, enforcement actions in that time against digital asset market participants, right? And so this, this idea of regulation through enforcement has become the norm and to the detriment of 
being able to create investor protections, full and fair disclosures, capital formation, the list goes on and on. And when I'm sitting on a panel like this with other folks who are running regulated crypto businesses, you know, we brought our business to life here in the U.S., following U.S. rules and regulations, as did a lot of the other folks here, um, it becomes very difficult to scale or grow a business if the only examples you have are to not repeat those enforcement actions that have been brought about. Now, we'd all probably agree that there's tons of enforcement actions that have come about to get rid of bad actors and weed them out of the crypto space, and we'd all certainly be supportive of them. But to Jeremy's point, to rely on, you know, 80, 90 plus year old legislation that just does not account for the attributes of crypto assets or even attempts on the, you know, the, the part of policymakers or regulators to evolve their thinking and actually develop new frameworks um, becomes really, really challenging. And so the extent to which the U.S. policy doesn't catch up to the pace of innovation here, we do stand to lose dominance, whether it's developers, whether it's businesses, whether it's tax revenues to other jurisdictions where folks are building, they're building productively, and oftentimes they're doing it in a regulatory sandbox where they can actually do so without fear that as they engage with their regulator, they're not suddenly going to come back and actually take you know, legal action or some kind of punitive action against those companies or the products and services that they're providing. So I jump in here too that um, if we if we think of this from the context of the innovator's dilemma, which is typically used more in a company context but less in a nation state context, the U.S. is approaching crypto as the incumbent that has been able to control the money rails uh, for the last many decades and believes it has a lot to lose because of crypto um, and also that it can control the underlying substrate. And I would argue that that both are actually untrue. Um, and so on one hand, because the U.S. thinks it has home field advantage or it can control this movement, it's being lazy, as, as Jeremy mentioned. Um, but then at the same time, these are P2P currencies, P2P commodities, P2P securities, all on a substrate that is native to the digital and where the U.S. can't actually enforce jurisdiction. And so if they try and control it, as we're seeing the capital and the talent squeezes elsewhere. Um, whereas what I would love to see is actually embracing it. And I think Nick Carter has made some good arguments recently um, for how crypto can actually, and you know, Jeremy's the perfect person for this, can actually help reinforce dollar strength um, around the world, which we know is a priority for, for the government. And I think there are other ways in which if the US were to lean into this as the innovator it once was, you know, we I, I think we probably all agree that the U.S. would benefit, but actually as an incumbent, it is taking the absolute worst strategy uh, right now. Couldn't agree more. It, it, it is quite interesting that uh, there is a growing realization, I think, I think at least bottom up, that the U.S. having a lack of clarity around regulation is really just preventing the U.S. from participating in this innovation rather than stopping the innovation outright, uh, especially with something like crypto being a global, open, and permissionless phenomena, you're seeing that the underlying protocols themselves you know, haven't really skipped a beat. And if anything, makes the case for why they're, they're so important and what their primary value proposition is. Anti-fragile. There is a lot of anti-fragile fragility to, to the system. So I guess my question is, are there is there any low hanging fruit that the that U.S. regulators can can pick uh, to just provide regulatory clarity? Is is there are there some just glaringly obvious things um, that, that, that the U.S. can? Yeah, please, Jeremy, please. I mean, literally, I think like if you go to D.C. and you talk to people, like everyone sort of says like the lowest hanging fruit should be. Uh, stablecoin uh, legislation and, and rules. And I, I think it's it's sort of the most obvious, which is you're dealing with the dollar, you're dealing with uh, a, a, a very clear activity that intersects with the banking system. Uh, there's very clear investor protection needs that are more straightforward potentially to deal with than defining new classes of instruments, which is I think part of the harder issue with digital assets. Um, and, um, and, you know, 
it's been something that the government has very clearly been calling for for multiple years. I mean, like complete consensus at a global level and then at a national level, whether it's the Fed, Treasury, the, the White House, others, uh, at least a, a, a clear mandate that there needs to be payment stable coin legislation. And, you know, it was nearly two years ago, a year and a half ago, where the presidential working group made a statement that, um, you know, it's urgent that Congress act because you might have collapses and runs and other things. And we've seen multiple significant incidents, incidents uh, over time. And the most recent one, which we can come back to, of, of sort of the fractional reserve banking system infecting, you know, the stablecoin system uh, with, with its, its, its inherent risks as well. All these are, are indicators. And the, I, would, I would just say, I have, uh, I want to sort of uh, offer a note of, of optimism here, which is that um, we're seeing really good positive signals about this in Washington, uh, that there is a desire to see legislation passed here. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think, you know, watch this space closely. I think that this is something that you are gonna see progress and it is potentially the, the, the lowest hanging fruit that has clear, um, you know, administration, agency and, and bipartisan support. Now there's a lot of complexity in there and it's not like, you know, exactly what you can get done. There's, there's complexity and there's state rights and federal rights. There's a lot of complexity to the issue. Um, clearly, but it does seem like something people want to take action on. And you're talking specifically about stablecoin legislation? Yeah. Really? yeah. What, the, okay. the term of art is payment stablecoins, uh, to sort of say cl clearly something designed to be a payment system innovation that is fully reserved and can operate, you know, as a, as a tokenized form of cash and function on the internet. Um, that, that, you know, a, a very a fair, somewhat narrow definition, not sort of trying to accommodate algorithmic stable coins or crypto collateralized stable coins or, or uh, uh, other things, but a, a very straight fiat stable coin model. And Jeremy, to your point, which I think is interesting, the, the, the uh, favorable outcome uh, or th there is a positive outlook within Washington. And I think we're, we're seeing glimpses of that where um, you know, when it's actually taken to courts and there's sort of an objective assessment on, uh, on whatever the, the, the situation is, that, that it, it ends up favoring crypto. And I'm thinking specifically about even the most, the, the, the most recent news around, you know, Michael, your, your work with, with Grayscale and the SEC and sort of pushing for a Bitcoin ETF. And we had our first, uh, you know, hearings where, uh, you know, the judge was, was, was pretty objective in, in her assessment. Uh, I, I'd be curious on you know your your take on uh, specifically the relationship with the SEC uh, and uh, and 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 relative to to courts. Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, I've known Jeremy a long time, and I have a lot of respect for him and everything that he's doing. But I am going to one up him and say that a Bitcoin ETF is even lower hanging fruit because there is no new legislation that needs to be passed in order to bring a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, to market here in the US, right? There are tried and true existing rules and regs. The ETF wrapper is something that has been purpose built and battle tested. Um, and it is simply an opportunity to give investors a safer, more secure, fuller and fairer disclosures um, and, and give them exposure to an innovative asset, which we know they want and we know that they deserve. Um, but if I take a big step back, you see, and I'd say that, you know, this has been core to Grayscale's DNA since day one. Um, and I think a lot of it has come down to education. So spending an unbelievable amount of time in Washington, a lot of time with the SEC, specifically mostly rooted in education. And we've really taken them on a journey over the last you know, six, seven years, um, meetings with standing room only um, at the SEC and, you know, seeing the questions evolve from, you know, highly skeptical to questions that have actually been super well thought of and researched and, and you know, evocative of kind of their interest in engaging on these issues. And, you know, ultimately we, you know, not many folks know this, but we work behind the scenes for almost two years with the SEC to convert GBTC into an SEC reporting company. And that was 
direct engagement of definitions and accounting rules and disclosures and ultimately resulted in it becoming the first you know, digital asset investment vehicle to become SEC reporting. And so I think where we find ourselves now is unfortunately in a professional, uh, at least from our end, we hope professionally, you know, designed lawsuit where the SEC denied our application. We've been advocating for investors all along the way, and ultimately we're left with the option of having to litigate. Um, and so to your point, we just had oral arguments in the case, and we do expect a decision from the courts, hopefully by the third quarter of this year. And again, to hopefully vacate the SEC's denial and actually allow for GBTC to uplist to the New York Stock Exchange and you know become the the ETF that that we all want and have been waiting for. Michael, if I can just jump in as a practitioner of the craft, I have to uh, fully endorse the notion that your 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 suit was exquisitely crafted. It was, <laughs> I think, about as well argued uh, a, a case as I've seen in twenty five years. I will say that the courts, coming back, Yassine, to your point about their perspective, um, actually do, I think, offer some, some um, cause for hope. Um, and, and I think the reason why that is so, certainly in Michael's case, we saw three federal circuit judges asking good, hard questions, um, raising concerns, maybe even expressing skepticism around certain points, but they were willing to engage with a record they were willing to look to the law um, and, and, and apply it as it is actually constructed. And that same dynamic has played out in just about every single court case that has, that has gone any distance. Look at the comments from the bench, for example, in the Voyager bankruptcy, where the federal bankruptcy judge was explicit that the regulators have made a mess of the situation, even as many firms, including ours and others represented on this on this call have been operating in plain sight for years. We've seen the same skepticism time and again from judges who are being asked to twist and turn laws in ways that they are simply unwilling to do. And so while I do think we will see um, setbacks uh, along the way, I, I think the courts are actually giving us a lot of reason to believe that if there is an objective assessment of the SEC's jurisdiction, if there's an objective assessment of how these statutes written by Congress decades ago could apply and must be applied uh, to modern technologies, we're going to get a fair hearing. You know, I'd love to hear from Angie. I know that she has worked with the regulators uh, in the crypto world and uh, has ha had sort of a transformational experience, but uh, also uh, seems to I, I don't know if this is, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Angie, but, um, you know, this idea that, d you know, these regulations are 80 years old and, uh, you know, aren't, aren't really set up to incorporate this new world. Um, I'm not so sure you agree with that, um, or maybe your thinking has evolved. I agree that, I agree with Paul, uh, that the reality is other countries are, are looking a lot more attractive and a lot more welcoming to crypto companies. Um, and Chris, you your comments made me think that I'm also surprised that the SEC hasn't raised any positive examples that we can point to in terms of kind of showing us a way here. Um, but I, I would say that this anti-crypto tone that we're seeing from regulators is really a response to FTX, a lot of it, uh, and retail investor protection. And um, I think we would have made a lot more progress if it wouldn't happen, have happened. So, um, and I also think that there's a tendency to focus, you know, solely on the SEC. Um, but, you know, many in Congress were lulled into the waters by FTX and, and they, they kind of have to swing the other way. Now, if what you said, Jeremy, is the case that we're seeing bipartisan support, I mean, that's a positive signal here uh, from Congress. But um, outside of that, it's U.S. regulators in addition to the SEC that are really kind of coming together here. I mean, last year there was this general view that the CFTC was kind of this kinder, gentler, gentler regulator. Um, and we can see with UkiDAO and, and Binance that they're also flexing their regulatory muscles too. So, and I think that that, you know, is, is sounds like maybe more specific to unregistered exchanges. But regardless, I think... From an SEC perspective, 
there are certain levels of investor protection um, that we do need to see that we haven't seen. And so my perspective, as you mentioned, Kathy, I have worked with the SEC, but prior to crypto, you know, and, and I run a, a broker dealer now, prior to crypto, I was in the traditional uh, finance world and capital markets. And generally, generally, people kind of went to the SEC to go through and make sure that everything was kind of, you know, all the boxes were checked. It's like, oh, we have to go to the SEC. And and I was really surprised back in the day when they said, come in and talk to us. And I thought everybody was going to rush in like, OK, we got to go and talk to the SEC. And, you know, I think that it's, you know, these are different risks than we've seen in, in other securities. Um, and frankly, on the part of crypto, um, we I mean, we can't be blind to the fact that that we've seen different levels of compliance. Um you know, disclosures, conf uh, conflicts of interest, um, general communications. Uh, we've seen a lot of rug pulls. We've seen a lot of, you know, commingling of customer accounts and, uh, you know, frankly, fraud. So I think that there has to be um, some sort of a, um, you know, common ground to find. But I, I agree, again, with Paul that the reality is other countries are moving faster and looking a lot more attractive and a lot more welcoming. Can I just uh, ask Angie uh, on that? It seems to me that a lot of regulators and politicians used FTX, uh, you know, if they were already biased against cr crypto, uh, to further their own cause. But uh, as we've been saying uh, here at ARC, if you look at uh, Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum, they did not skip a beat throughout all of this. And this contrast, even uh, the newest member of the SEC is talking about decentralization as being critical, transparency, auditability. And of course, FTX and these centralized opaque institutions are the ones who, uh, who actually went down. Uh, don't you think that now in the face of, you know, regional banks going bankrupt and, uh, and, and different digital assets soaring, uh, that, you know, th this is a very loud message to regulators. And, and, and an inability uh, that's been documented for legitimate crypto operators uh, to service uh, w within the traditional banking system. Yes, um, so absolutely. I, yeah, Angie, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love your thoughts on the... the I'd say the the response in the last month to the banking crisis, as being uh, as really feeling like you're you're sing singling out crypto as an industry um, to 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 participate in traditional financial services. Yeah, I I agree with what what you both point out. It does feel that there is a you know a singling out. And I think on on I think this is a moment to really separate decentralized from centralized and um, you know educate the world on like what really happened and 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 because there are people outside of this call and people in the general population kind of lump it all together um, and yeah I I do think that some of this will come to light I think a lot of the um, issues with Signature Bank and I'd love to hear Caitlin's uh, views on this. Um, will come to light because there there's enough there that I've seen at least that I think we're going to get more clarity on and 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 doesn't quite look fair. Um, I I do think though that like when you look back to decentralization generally, um, you know there was a lot of Bill Hinman came out and talked about this idea that something could morph from uh, a security to something else if a network was sufficiently decentralized. Um, that led to a lot of decentralization theater, I would say, in crypto. Uh, and um, so the SEC responded with this framework for investment contract for digital assets. Um, and I think that um, a lot of the uh, decentralization uh, concepts that have been presented by the SEC have somewhat been ignored by some of the bad actors, um, meaning, you know, 
you know, just just general control uh, is and operational control and and communications and and disclosures, um, which all seem to be low hanging fruit, by the way. And there are many good actors um, who are who are doing things right. Uh, m- many of whom are on this call. So I think that it's unfortunate. I think a lot of a lot of things are happening that are pretty unfortunate in terms of where we are as a as a country in crypto. Can I just say just one thing because I do want to hear Caitlin's perspective in a second. But you know, we just finished Q1 of this year, um, and we've all talked about FTX and all the other recent happenings in the crypto space. But during Q1, I've spent uh, quite a few days on the hill with my team. And I want to provide just a slightly different perspective of, of what I've seen and experienced. Um, there's a lot of issues um, in front of politicians at the moment. Um, and one thing that has been encouraging, and I want to do try and paint somewhat of an encouraging picture here, not as dire as, as some might think, is that there is bipartisan support around crypto, which is relatively unique. It's it's usually, when you look at these types of issues, you usually do see some greater divisions amongst political parties. And the fact that we now have several bills that went to the floor of Congress in 2022 are redrafting and retooling themselves for reintroduction in this new Congress, several new bills that are coming before this new Congress as well. Um, And the fact that we now even have a dedicated subcommittee on digital assets within the House Financial Services Committee is, is all progress in my view. I actually thought that being in Washington in the earlier part of this year, I would be having to spend a lot more time helping to get folks to understand the differentiation between regulated businesses like mine and some of the other colleagues on the on, on this call, um, or you know that of FTX. And actually, they understood it pretty quickly. And so, what I've experienced is actually a propensity on the part of offices in both you know, both sides of Congress, both sides of the aisle, um, actually wanting to get involved and wanting to do something, the toughest challenge that they all find themselves at the moment is where do they start, right? And so for many of them, they do believe, to Jeremy's point, that, you know, stablecoin regulation um, may be one of the easiest places for them to get started and get some traction. But there is a generally, you know, wide-held belief amongst these offices that we're engaging with that crypto is here to stay and that they simply cannot just cover their eyes and plug their ears and pretend like it's, you know, going to somehow vanish or that, you know, increasingly Americans aren't going to be owning or interacting with crypto. So I'm I'm increasingly optimistic. Um, It just obviously we're all painting a picture that it's not happening as fast as we, of course, wish it was. So, Michael, one, just on that, I, I do think I do think that uh, FTX did throw a wrench into the support because we felt the bipartisan support before that and maybe before Terra Luna, but especially before uh uh, before FTX, and then and then there was silence, and maybe maybe now they're all in the back rooms, but they are not out there advocating the way they were. There is silence, and we are moving into an election year. So I just hope you're right, and during the election year, that bipartisan spirit comes back. Sure, sure, I I agree with you. The FTX certainly was n- no doubt a setback. Um, But for other offices, it was actually, I think, a wake up call. Um, If we're not already educated on this, if we're not already engaging on this, we should be, we need to be. Um, And I think certainly when we look back to even the midterm elections pre-FTX, you know, there were various, you know, politicians that were looking at their constituencies and actually running on ideas like crypto um, when, when, you know, going to get people to encourage them to go out to the polls. So it will be interesting to see, but I'm increasingly a a little bit more optimistic than maybe I once was. I would add one comment there, which is uh, on a global scale, there, there actually is a, a lot of coordination happening at like the FSB level, at the G20 level to try and basically say we need normalized, globally consistent crypto markets and stablecoin uh, regulation. And I think that you're going to see a big push coming from that. And that will find its way down into every jurisdiction. And I actually also think that the U.S., certain participants in the U.S. government understand that 
other jurisdictions are moving faster and are going to have model law in place in enforcement in 2024. EU-wide, UK-wide, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, like it's very clear. Uh, and, 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 you know, members in Congress are really coming up to speed on what, you know, crypto markets regulation looks like in other jurisdictions, uh, what stablecoin regulation looks like. And so I, I think this sort of global normalization, as well as sort of this, you know, in, in some ways, a desire to sort of see not widely disparate types of approaches to this, at least in major G20 markets or, or certain sort of large markets, I, that gives me some confidence that we'll, we'll kind of see um, more movement here um, and, uh, and less focused on uh, regulation by enforcement and more policymaking and legislating. Uh, which is really what what our elected leaders are meant to do. I've been listening very carefully, uh, and I unfortunately have to disagree that, that there's reason for optimism coming out of Washington D.C. There, there wasn't a, an ability when when Congress, both sides of Congress and the presidency, were in Democratic Party hands to get anything done. And now we've got divided government, and uh, I agree with Jeremy that the greatest probability in terms of a bill coming through Congress is in the stablecoin area. But from my own experience, the, the, uh, the probability of getting something done is only 20 or 30% in the next couple of years. And the biggest issue is the elephant in the room we haven't talked about, which is what the bank regulators have done. I've always said that the bank regulators are far more important than the SEC to this industry because they have the ability to shut off the U.S. dollar access, and that is exactly what they're trying to do. And uh, Lynn, you and I engaged about your piece in, uh, in either the day before or yesterday, or yesterday I can't remember on open open um, open networks. I think the statement that was made in by the bank regulators in January, January third, where the bank regulators came out against the use of open, public, and or decentralized networks was really important. And it does pick up on the, on the point that Jeremy made that, that there is an anti-tech thread coming out of Washington, D.C. And I think I can help shed some light on why. But let's pause on that. They didn't say open, public, and or decentralized blockchain networks. They said open, public, and or decentralized networks. In other words, TCP IP, HTTP, et cetera, right? The internet. They very clearly said banks have heightened risk using open, public, and or decentralized networks. And at first, I thought that was a drafting error, uh, essentially just you know lawyers uh, writing policy without consulting with tech people. But as, as time has gone on, and we've seen the challenge with online banking and what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and how fast the bank run occurred and how backwards the tech. So I've known this for, for you. It takes about three years to, st to get a bank stood up in the United States because of all the little details that you have to deal with. It's not rocket science, but it just takes a, a tremendous amount of time. And the way you integrate with the Fed is through an approved integrator, et cetera. It's just an enormous amount of detail. And, and the gist is that that, that, that those systems that are operated by the Fed, the payment systems, which are controlled by the Fed. And again, ultimately, this is really this is a, an important point because the U.S. dollar access to the extent that it matters is controlled by the Fed and, and they have very antiquated technology. And I think one of the things that scared them about what happened with the bank runs, but also with crypto, is just how far ahead crypto got relative to their own technology. And if you look at what happened with the banks that that had the bank runs, there certainly was a, an ability to, to step in and provide liquidity to those banks. For example, with Signature, uh, if, if they'd waited one day, there would have the Fed's uh, BTFP program would have been in place. Signature arguably would not have been needed to to be put into receivership, um, but but they didn't wait that one day. Uh, and let me close by saying th the Fed made a significant break with the president's working group. There were references earlier to the president's working group, um, which which uh, which recommended that stablecoins only be able to be issued by insured depository institutions. That was about eighteen months ago. The Fed came out very strongly opposed to any 
tokenized US dollar issued on a open public permissionless blockchain, even if issued by a bank. So that is a, a big hurdle that's going to have to be overcome. And at this point, with, uh, with, with the divided House and the White House having come out on January 27th with its new policy statement, which also itself arguably broke with the original president's working group recommendation, uh, there's, a, there's now a real cloud over whether anything is going to get done to reverse th this. And I'll close by saying uh, what, what we've been told is that because Congress wasn't able to act, that is why the regulators chose in early January to make the big move against, against this industry. And so the, the punchline is, uh, I'm afraid, the likely base case is that, that this industry is just going to have to wait out the next uh, couple of years until the next presidential election. Caitlin, I, th I think you, you make some super strong points. And, and I think that the getting over the line on the use of public blockchains for issuing and operating dollar infrastructure, right? That's certainly a cross that I'm, I'm trying to bear as well. And I, I think, I think, um, but I, I think it gets to the heart of the matter, right? And and you know we all looked at at the at those at, at those that very specific language. And I think this is sort of goes all the way up to like the Bank of International Settlements and CPMI frameworks and other things. But but basically, I think this is probably one of the most important issues on the table here, which is that, and this this is as old as the internet, right? Which is you know, whether you're a telecoms regulator, a communications and media regulator, a, uh, a, a commerce regulator, other regulators in other industries, the use of the open internet, peer-to-peer -peer software, open source infrastructure, open source software, which basically makes the world work. Um, you know, re regulators broadly and the industries that were, were built by oftentimes government-run national monopolies in different places, you know, we're highly skeptical of, of using open internet networks to do that. And guess what? Over and over and over, it's been proven wrong. And I think um, the, the job of the industry right now is to create massive utility value as quickly as it possibly can. And if there's, if there's not clear regulation, obviously work as, as much as possible within the realm of the possible to achieve scale and demonstrate that you can actually deliver resilient uh, you know, powerful mechanisms of value exchange and 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 the like, all around the world, and and put it in the hands of billions of people. And I think that can happen in 24 months. It can happen before there's a new president. It can happen before there's legislation passed. And so I think you know this is this is where technologists and entrepreneurs need to need to step in. Now I realize it's not quite so simple because we are dealing with access to the dollar system or the you know, these sort of constraints on liquidity and, and other things. Um, but if you, you know, you look, look very carefully at all this, you know, the door's not shut um, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, very clearly banks are able to provide services to a firm like Circle. And they're very clear about that. And the risk management requirements and the risk thresholds that banks are going to put around major firms that they work with are going to be different. We're seeing that happen now in this space. Uh, but the door's not been shut. And, um, you know, I think one of my biggest jobs is, you know, con convincing, um, you know, convincing policymakers and, and regulators that you can build things on the internet, <laughs> that the internet actually can be safe and more resilient. And in fact, that decentralized public chains are more safe, more secure, more resilient, more transparent, more auditable, and actually can build underlying primitives for security and privacy and other things that are, are far superior to the existing uh, closed loop financial systems that we have. And, and so I, I think, um, you know, we can win on the merits <laughs> is, is, is what I believe in the end. Well, and I'd run with the merits too, even on the, um, on the weekend where SVB was hanging in the balance. Um, I, as a VC was working with a number of portfolio companies across placeholders portfolios. And, um, one really interesting thing we saw is because crypto has always been we could just say mistreated by the banking system or at least skeptical of the banking system and valuing redundancy. We, we didn't have a single portfolio team that had the entirety of their funds at SVB. Um, and we heard a lot of different uh, situations 
with, say, uh, more Web2 focused VCs where there was real crisis at, at a lot of these companies where their entirety of their assets, of their payroll, or at least the significant majority was at SVB. And what was really interesting for all the crypto native companies is not only did they have, um, you know, redundancy and with that redundancy resiliency, but their banking system was open on the weekend. And so they could take action on Saturday and Sunday when anyone who was stuck within the traditional banking system was frozen and basically waiting to see what the government was was going to do. And so I think one of the ironies coming out of that was, at least from my perspective as, as an investor in crypto natives, um, even though crypto was getting targeted, it was more resilient throughout that crisis and continues to be more resilient. The other thing I'd say is, um, Jeremy, the, the door can't be shut um, because, you know, information is like water and these crypto assets are really just information and they just keep flowing in these different places. And the U.S. will try and put up these dams, but then, you know, the water will just flow around or there will be a new storm, a valley over and there will be water over there. Um, and so at least from from where I said, it goes back to what I said earlier. It's really, you know, the U.S. either gets on board or this just all keeps flowing around the U.S. I think that's a great segue. Great points, Chris, on what what exactly do we make of this regional banking crisis, not just relative to crypto, but the broader economy? Is this potentially a, a, an accelerant uh, for people to realize that we do have this, as Chris likes to call it, internet financial system, mm -hmm. uh, and that this should be the catalyst to sort of port uh, traditional services and financial actions into a crypto world? I mentioned crypto being a global phenomena. How does this impact uh, the geopolitics, the broader economy. Maybe we can we can start with with you, Kathy, um, and just to get your broader thoughts in terms of the crisis. In terms of the yeah, uh, yeah. setting up the crisis. I, you and know, then, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, the reason it's happened, and I'd love to hear uh, Lynn's thoughts on this. But uh, you know, the, the the banks made two major uh, mistakes in their assumptions, and both of them actually are very understandable. Uh, because uh, these two uh, as assumptions proved wrong because they had either never happened or never happened in our lifetimes. So one of them was during COVID, uh, as the Fed and everybody else was worried about depression, um, you look at the Fed's forecast in that year of 2020, they had interest rates uh, out, short-term interest rates at 0.2 through the end of this year, which is where their forecast ended. So you've got these banks like Silicon Valley and others who uh, say, okay, I'll put my money into government-backed long-term instruments, very safe, maybe too much held to maturity in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, but very safe, right? 1.6, 1.7% yield. And then the Fed raises interest rates 20-fold in one year, which has never happened. Never, never, never happened. Volcker was twofold, 10 to 20%. And many people brushed off, you know, our concern about this because, oh, it's such a low base. That's exactly the point. It's been such a low base for so long that nobody expected this. So that was the first mistaken assumption. And even that would have been okay as long as the deposits had kept flowing in which of course they didn't. We had the venture capital funding drought. That's why Silicon Valley's deposits started departing. And others were just looking for higher yields and money market funds. And if you look at, lar many people think the large banks have been immune from this. They have not. Uh, their deposits are falling as well. And it is because of this um, search for yield and safety. I mean, the most damning thing I've heard during the past few weeks from a number of people uh, uh, who said, well, yeah, I lowered my risk by taking my deposits out and increased my t return by putting them into money market. That's not how this works, you know, lowering your risk and increasing your return. So uh, I think that's how it started. I think the Fed has, you know, Ha, ha, has made a, a lot of mistakes. And I think the reason is it does not respect 
market signals. Doesn't respect credit default swaps uh, going up, so bets on bankruptcy. Doesn't respect inverted yield curves. Doesn't respect commodity prices going down. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot, and, and is the first Fed ever to raise interest rates in a crisis, and now they're thinking about doing it again. So, I mean, I'll just set it up that way. There, the, and I'd love to hear uh, I, uh, Lynn, and I, I saw Caitlin having uh, a point of view around this as well. Yeah, I think I think one of the challenges is like if we look at one bank, we get one opinion. But if we look at the banking system as a whole, we get another opinion. So any individual bank could have managed this better than, for example, some of the the you know the really problematic banks handled it. You know, they chose long duration. They chose a riskier deposit base, basically very business oriented. Uh, you know, very um, industry specific. You know, they set up two risks on the same balance sheet, which were which were catastrophic. But when you look at the uh, banking system as a whole, you know, someone has to own those. Securities securities uh, and they have to own them with these funding costs, kind of the way we set up the system as it currently is. And so the the, the sheer level of activism from the Fed is just an extremely hard environment for those banks to operate under. Ironically, if they had shorter duration but higher credit risk instruments, they held up better than if they had long duration risk-free assets in this in this environment, which is normally not how it works. And you know, back in like late 2021, the Fed, you know, inflation was way above target, and the Fed was still doing QE. Uh, they basically were, were, you know, slow to be hawkish. But then when they finally turned hawkish, now suddenly they they pull uh, liquidity out of the banking system at a record pace, while uh, you know, to, Kat, to, to Kathy's point, increasing interest rates at you know, it's, it, in a year-over-year basis, it's the highest absolute term since the 70s, but on a percentage basis from such a low base, it, it's the highest ever. And the bank system's not really designed to be able to withstand that type of turbulence. And if you look at the Federal Reserve itself, it's operating at a loss because part of its way of managing interest rates is it increases the rates on its own liabilities. And as the Federal Reserve, it's able to do that because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't need to be profitable, doesn't need to, uh, you know, it's not exposed to bank runs. But you know, if you were to just take the average bank now and put their deposit rates where money markets are. They'd almost all be unprofitable, and therefore they'd be losing capital from from their, and they'd be unable to raise capital. And so, on one hand, you know, if the Fed's saying, "Okay, all banks have to do what we did," well, then you just destroy the entire banking system. Um, and his, you know, in the past, prior few raising cycles, you know, you saw T bills go up in rates, you saw money markets go up in rates, and deposit rates didn't really follow because these were pretty brief changes. And they, you know, eventually those rates would come back down before people really adjusted uh, to those new rates. But if they do try to target a higher for longer environment, and in a world where information flows around faster, um, you know, the the ways of moving money are faster, uh, banks are kind of stuck having to raise their rates to try to keep up with this. And then the end game scenario is if they actually get up to where the Fed is on rates, if they get up to where money markets and T bills are. They're practically all in, in profitable, and then heading towards insolvency. So they're kind of like I think the Fed is just in some ways not understanding the gravity of the situation, and it's both on the upside and the downside. So they were overly aggressive on on things like QE, you know, more than longer than they needed to do it, and then now they're being super hawkish, and it's like a, it's just a very actively managed system more so than it I think needs to be. And actually, what we've seen, I don't know if you have done this with your own accounts personally. Um, I didn't even know how low some of the rates were on some of my accounts. And I said, heck, let me get out of here. So I've contributed to this. They've, they've actually advertised this and exacerbated it. Yeah, I think now um, there was a wake up call. It's like a lot of people were kind of complacent. And I think, you know, when, when it's considered low risk, they don't really chase, you know, the, Bank bank deposits have historically been pretty sticky. You don't shop around for a new bank just to get a couple extra basis points here or there. But when people are actually concerned with their with their risk, um, suddenly they pay a lot more attention. And when you see that it's that you know to the prior point about both higher yielding and lower risk, if they make certain choices to move, then they do it. And so we're still seeing very rapid inflows to money markets. And so all of that is pressuring the liquidity profiles of banks. And and something that Caitlin's pointed out before is that as money moves faster, if anything, banks need more liquidity. But one of the Fed's one of the Fed's tools in this environment is they're trying to constrain lending by pulling liquidity out, which is it's just kind of an interesting way of doing things. And I I think it's 
if, if anything, it shows kind of the downsides of such a manual, old school process of, of trying to, to run a financial system. The financial system, to Lynn's point, was, was geared towards the analog world. In a stress scenario for banks, the stress scenario was a 35% withdrawal of demand deposits in a short period of time. Well, we saw in the case of Silicon Valley, 25% withdrawal of all deposits, not just demand deposits, within hours. And, and that's exactly the point. A lot of folks are saying, well, the Fed is, is upgrading its technology. We obviously all read the, the Wall Street Journal story about how the Fed had to put a test trade through, and that's why the, the Silicon Valley Bank uh, cash couldn't uh, end up in its master account in time, and therefore it was closed down the next day. That, again, is how antiquated the back-end systems are. One of the, one of the banks that failed spent four years building the middleware to have that, that, that Ferrari front-end connected to the horse and buggy back end. Okay, so there's definitely a constraint there on, on, on really old technology. But the other reality is that if Fed now really does come out in July, which I'm not so sure it will, precisely because of what Lynn just talked about, that's going to exacerbate the liquidity issues in the banks. And the small banks had on average six cents for every dollar of deposit in cash. The large banks only had 10 cents for every dollar of deposit in cash. It was pretty obvious, and I was warning the bank regulators behind the scenes, but plus, of course, in, in public speeches going back a few years, that stable coins were going to pose bank run risk on the banks that were holding the reserves. And we saw that. And, uh, and of course, the depositors were bailed out. And by the way, this industry, because of stable coin deposits, got, was a beneficiary of that. Um, but the point is the banks always needed to sit with a lot more cash. The challenge is that the, 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 if the banks actually are required to sit with a lot more cash, to Lynn's point, how are they going to do that? They're going to have to liquidate some of these long-term assets at a loss, which is just going to expose the capital um, shortfall at, in the banking sector. So there's a real catch-22 right now uh, with the, the capitalization versus the liquidity of the banking sector. And that is not going to go away without a steepening of the yield curve, a real steepening, thinking back to the early 1990s, what Greenspan did to create a, he a very steep yield curve to try to recapitalize the banking system. That is going to have to happen again. Can I, I want to jump in just with a couple of thoughts on, on, on this. And, and um, I'll make a shameless self-promotion here, which is we just put out a podcast with Circle's chief economist, Gordon Liao, which covers a lot of these issues in a lot of depth. I highly encourage people to listen to it because it's fascinating. But I think, you know, this comes back to kind of first principles in crypto in some ways, right? Which is, you know, why, why did I get into this, you know, 11, 12 years ago? Was, I was interested in sound money theory. And I was interested after the financial crisis and understanding, you know, what went wrong? What were the issues in the monetary system, in the fractional reserve banking system? You know, why did why why do banks fail? You know all, all these kinds of issues, which really surfaced um, and, and drew my interest pretty significantly in two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten. And you have kind of two dimensions of this. You've got sound money theory around Bitcoin and Ethereum, and uh, a thesis around non sovereign commodity money and and what that can be. And you know, I, I'm, I'm, I have high conviction on that and, and believe that's going to grow and grow and be really important in the world. And then you, you have a separate set of sort of sound money theory as it, as it pertains to the nature of banking and payments. And this is this issue that's come up over and over again. It goes back to the 1930s and you know, the, the regulators had, the policymakers had a choice to make then. Prominent economists were recommending that you separate sort of base layer government obligation money in the payment system from lending activity. And that was, that was a, I think, a, a very sound uh, philosophy. Uh, and it was a sound money philosophy. You need, a, you need the base layer of money and the payment utility to be separate from these fractional reserve lending behaviors. And that was rejected by the banks because the banks liked their risk taking. And they said, let's do mutualized insurance instead. And that was the that was why the FDIC was created. And, you know, this has been revisited in the 1980s after the savings and loan crisis. It was revisited again after the financial crisis and some of that related to money market reforms as well. And I think that it's absolutely the appropriate time to be asking that again. And so 
I think Caitlin and I have both been advocating for this idea of full reserve banking, full reserve payment systems that have the ability to be interoperable across the, the world, that have the ability to take advantage of the technological innovation of digital bearer assets on the public internet, programmable, composable. You can do credit intermediation on these units on a global basis on blockchains and, and make huge progress in the nature of, of, of risk management, of financial services delivery, and all these kinds of things. Um, but you got to separate those. And so, you know, the, we've been pushing for a, a model where we can effectively have, you know, T-bills and cash at the Fed. That's, that's what we want. We've been pushing for that for three years. Um, and I know, Caitlin, you've run up against, you know, challenges there and, and there's a, a lot of, um, of issues there. But I think, um, you know, it is a legitimate time to be asking questions about the fractional reserve banking system. And are there better models for credit intermediation? which clearly there are, and are there better, better models for global payment utility and how that works? And so I think crypt, crypto has a lot to offer here, um, but it, it gets to this, this kind of core underlying structure of risk. Um, and and the, the current contemporary banking crisis is, is just playing this out again. Lynn, you mentioned the end game scenario. I, I'd be curious, what, what is your end game scenario if, the Fed continues to operate in the way that it has. Well, I mean, if it were to continue to be very hawkish uh, in, in an attempt at this, it would, I think, increasingly result in the instability in the banking system uh, and basically suck deposits towards the bigger banks and then towards ultimately to things like money markets and T-bills. Uh, and it kind of seizes up the whole formation of credit. And I think it really ends when securities markets go illiquid. I mean, we saw, you know, if you go back to say March, 2020, why did the Fed step in at such big scale in response to you know the the COVID crash the, the all that and it's because those security markets froze up you know the treasury market's supposed to be the most liquid you know it's supposed to be the most liquid market in the world essentially and it completely froze up because you had such so much dollar demand in the world as cash you know all the different cash flows dried up and all these entities around the world still had debts that they had to service and so they would sell treasuries into the market to get dollars and it would freeze up the whole system because there's no there's no marginal buyer of those treasuries so the fed had to step in and buy a trillion dollars worth of treasuries in three weeks and then continue it for a period of time and you saw that also back in the 2019, uh, 2019 September uh, repo spike. We kind of saw a similar thing here with the bank crash, basically that they had to provide liquidity with these loans. And so I think that you know the, the more hawkish they are, the more they're going to have to intervene with liquidity uh, to keep these kind of security markets functioning. On the other hand, if they get to a point where they're unable to tighten it the way that they maybe want to, while you still have very inflationary forces out there, large, you know, large uh, fiscal deficits, for example, basically that's a source of money creation. Then you get kind of uh, potentially this uh, uh, uncontrollable inflation in the sense that it's, it remains above their preferred target for longer periods of time, which becomes a political issue, becomes a uh, credibility reputational issue uh, for them to manage. And Again, I think a lot of their models for how this works are just old. They they assume kind of, you know, if you get if you get the labor market looser, that'll somehow help inflation, but it's not not if that's not the source of inflation. If this if the source of inflation is things like large fiscal deficits or a changing of globalization patterns or in some cases energy shortages, right? Th then, you know, there's only so much demand destruction that can really take care of that. And there, it's almost like you have to acknowledge that sometimes inflation is going to vary over different periods of time. And so I, I think really the whole I, the whole models that they operate under are challenged. And the last time we saw this environment was really the 1940s and the 50s. That's the last time where debts were this high relative to GDP. You started from the zero bound and you're trying to get, you know, basically trying to get out of that situation. And obviously, it's a very different environment now, very, very different technology, very different geopolitics. But that kind of shows, I think, the scale of the problem. You know, we've had 40 years of rising debt as a percentage of GDP, which was offset by 40 years of declining interest rates, which, which allowed those higher and higher debt levels to be serviced. So our economy in large parts built up on this ever higher credit, but without the corresponding increases in payments to service that credit. And now we're kind of entering this new regime 
And that challenges, I think, a lot of the existing financial system in ways that are more than just cyclical, more than just, you know, what's the Fed going to do this year? What, what are they going to do? Are they going to get inflation down to 2%, you know, in a year or two? Those are all tactical questions. But the, the bigger strategic thing is I think the system itself is just, it's, it's, it's getting long in the tooth. Can I just take, at least introduce the other side of that? I think, um, you know, this is, wow, back to the future. Um, most of you don't know Henry Kaufman and Al Wojnlauer Wojnlau in the uh, late 70s and the 80s. They were doctors' death and doom. Uh, and uh, Henry Kaufman in particular uh, was focused on the crowding out of the private sector because of the public sector. And of course, it was very inflationary back then. I mean, that's what was going on. But I actually think what's going on right now is highly deflationary. If you look, we've just had a bank crisis. And typically, when you go through a crisis, um, the velocity of money falls. Uh, money growth itself, M2, is negative. I think for, uh, for March, it will be somewhere between minus 3 and minus 4%. Uh, for the second quarter, probably, uh, they, they've said they're not going to change anything, minus 4%. If velocity just stabilizes here, uh, we will have a hard landing in the second half of this year. And uh, I, I, think, uh, I think that um, that the fixed income markets are, are starting to telegraph this with spreads widening out as the treasury yields fall. And there is a flight to safety, which is also associated with velocity actually coming down. So if we were to compound a declining money growth with declining velocity, we'd be in a, a mess of a situation. So I think, I think we're at a very important moment uh, in terms of just the recognition. The Fed, Fed is ignoring signals in the marketplace. It does not respect them because it has, I don't think we've looked at this, not one of the Fed members has worked as an investor in the uh, financial markets, the closest is Neil Kashkari, who was in M and A at uh, at Goldman and probably relationship management at Pimco. But you know, they're not reading the signals from the marketplace. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, sorry, I was just yeah. In the, in the tactical sense, uh, disinflation continues to be the obviously the dominant factor. Um, and you know we're seeing in the yield curve, we're seeing all these different market signals. It's obviously a big threat to commercial real estate. It's a big threat to um, private equity valuations. And this is you know when they talk about those long and variable lags, this is you know a after a year of tightening, we're we're very firmly into those lags now. And so even the existing tightening, as existing debts roll over at these higher rates, it, I think it compounds. And so you know when people say they want inflation down, what they really mean is they want disinflationary growth. And right now, they're, they're kind of the dial that they're operating under is either like recession or, you know, inflation, essentially. That's kind of the, the regime they've been in now for a couple of years. And I think that that's, you know, it, it's going to be a, a certainly challenging six months because now they're, they're still trying to do as much demand destruction as possible against the fact that, you know, most of the inflation we're seeing was not due to, say, excess bank lending, for example, like it was in the 70s, there are very different inflationary forces in it, and yet they're responding to it as though it was like the 70s, which is quite a different environment. That's absolutely wrong. It's more like the 19-teens. We had a war, World War I, we had uh, Spanish flu, and we had massive innovation, actually. And inflation, we were on the gold standard, but dropped from 24% in June of 1920 to minus 15% in June of 1921 because the money supply was shrinking. And we were on the gold standard. So it's much more similar to that period of time. The, the hopeful thing here is that all ended up in the roaring 20s. So uh, that's my bet. But uh, we still have a, a, a long way to go before here and there. Well, and the Fed's balance sheet is going to expand pretty substantially because of the the setup that we just described. It's it it, to, it topped nine trillion in the last crisis. It'll probably top twenty twenty five trillion. You start looking at the at the liquidity that's going to have to be provided in order to prop up the banking system if long term interest rates continue to stay as high. 
as they are. And that is, is how they'll essentially support the banking system. But by the way, that's not necessarily inflationary, right? Because it's a swap from the banking system. Exactly. Exactly. It's a swap from the, from the existing banking system uh, to the Fed's balance sheet, but that doesn't necessarily cause CPI to spike for sure. But the, but all of that, by the way, is really positive for Bitcoin. And we're seeing lots of people being orange pilled for the first time. Yeah. Well, and I would jump in there too, that, um, you know, if you look at Bitcoin and I would include Ethereum in this and a number of the other um, more distributed layer one networks, they don't have a P&L, right? They don't have solvency risks. Um, they finance themselves on a daily basis by issuance to a set of actors. And those actors do have P&L, um, but they, you know, locate geographically wherever works for them in order to run those services to support that network in a way that's profitable for them. And so um, one of the things you seen you had mentioned that I'm pushing the term the internet financial system, because I think we need to grow out of the defiant stage or the DeFi stage of what a lot of this means. And I've I've loved DeFi as a term for, for where we were as an industry then, but now it's more being unapologetic about the fact that this is a superior technology on a you know superior substrate substrate or architecture and you know there's a lot of bad behavior as you would expect with any new technology but there's also a lot of promise that gives us solutions to the current problems that we're facing as a society um, and so that's where i'm really just localizing it as this is the internet financial system and fintech has really kind of been you know a combination of traditional finance um it's it's kind of like electrification as opposed to true digitization um and this is the native digi digitization that we need and so i think just the quicker people can see that or maybe this crisis you know just accelerates people seeing that as as you mentioned we're seeing with bitcoin right now caitlin could not, not agree more, Chris. On. Can you can, go go ahead, Angie? Yep. I was just going to say not to pile onto the Bitcoin comments, but I do think that, as Jeremy said, this these these digital asset kind of seeds were planted with the Bitcoin white paper um, and everything that came with it, and um, you know, a system that doesn't need third parties, that doesn't include the need to trust intermediaries, um, and I think that at least. Uh, we do have, at least in this country, support for Bitcoin. Um, so I'm excited to see some of the some of the applications that can be built on top of it. So circling back to Caitlin's comments on people being orange pilled, I think at least anecdotally, it has been super interesting to see some of the inbound that we've received, uh, seeing Bitcoin's reaction to this banking crisis, uh, and perhaps sort sort of being the foot in the door to to Chris's point, uh, encouraging and building out a, a more uh, open internet financial system. Uh, Chris, I, I'd love for you to you know unpack further. Uh, have you have you seen uh, you know specific examples that you can give uh, just around this crisis with regard to DeFi or IFS, however you want to define it? Um, that 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 really just shows the, the the strength of the value proposition and why something like this is is so imperative. You, you obviously mentioned, you know, your experience with portfolio companies and the redundancies that they've uh, that they've incorporated, uh, ultimately signaling that they don't really need the traditional financial system to operate, or at least they're they're hedging against a single uh, single failure in the way that they have. Uh, unpack that further for us. Sure. Well, certainly post FTX, we've seen a shift more towards on chain. Um, and Uniswap released a, a pretty surprising stat um, and, uh, that you know Uniswap volumes have surpassed Coinbase volumes for the last two months. Now Coinbase, in part with their decentralized offering, does use Uniswap, and so there's a bit of a data discrepancy there. Um, but just even the fact that we have a uh, a decentralized provider at the same scale, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, who's bigger, but at the same scale as Coinbase, which is, you know, the the one of the most reputable centralized exchanges out there. That, I think, if you go back to 2018, 2019, felt like a very distant future, right? Like maybe 10 years out, and it's here in, in half that time. 
So that would be a major um, recent proof point. Also, just when you look at how the, the systems unwound, the, the decentralized systems, and, and more than decentralized, the systems that run on blockchains are auto accounting systems, right? And so the way that they delevered um, is automatic uh, following the FTX crisis. And what's interesting is everyone who was pinched had to pay back the auto accounting systems first. There was no negotiating. Right. And so then those systems remain solvent. Um, and then, you know, we see the whole messy process that happens within the traditional system. Now, you know, that auto accounting can cut both ways as these systems continue to grow and become more systemic. And I'm, I'm not blind to that. But, you know, on the whole, I would say that when we when we look at the FTX meltdown and then the recent banking crisis, um, as has been pointed out many times in this conversation, Anything that is a robust protocol built on an auto accounting system has continued to chug along um, and it doesn't face solvency risks and it's open 24 seven, 365 and, you know, payments on the whole are relatively cheap. And so these are all things that we all know, you know, by heart and, and that we experience on a weekly basis. And so then it's just getting regulators to see it's not shadowy super coders playing random games. Um, you know, it's, real business, real commerce, operating at the speed of light around the world. And that's important for, say, innovation globally, but also within the U.S. Some other, you know, just stats that, that, that I think put this in the right context. When you look at Bitcoin and Ethereum, they're settling par or they're settling value on par with MasterCard now, right? That's, that's a giant payments network. Um, and so... That's another one that I've been using uh, um, more. And, and se settling orders of magnitude more than MasterCard um, as well in terms of tr just broader transfer volume settling on chain. Um, and I know the, the, the most recent stat, 2022, a lot of people don't recognize or appreciate. Bitcoin settled $33 trillion of value. That's, that's three times that of, of, of Visa's transfer volume. Of mm -hmm. course, there is some... Um, you know, consolidation amongst exchanges, so they're not in, in independent entities, but that is settlement at the base layer, $33 trillion. Right. And so that's amazing, you know, and so, uh, again, these things are getting to a scale um, that, I, that I think people don't fully recognize. And I remember at, in my time at ARC, um, working under you, Kathy, you were pointing out that a lot of the economic statistics or things that people would look at we're always out of date because they were looking at the traditional systems and they just can't keep up with the rate of growth of the new systems. And I think we have that very thing going on um, within both the internet financial system, but also crypto broadly. I think your point on the, the Uniswap uh, Coinbase flippening or however you want to call it is, is a really interesting signal. Uh, I'd be curious, Paul, on your take, because, you know, we've heard, um, and I think Coinbase has done a, a, a tremendous job recognizing that uh, they're, they want to act as that, as that bridge and, and ultimately provide an on-ramp into this ecosystem. Uh, the launch of Coinbase Wallet, you know, base protocol, building out actual L2, that's, that's, that's quite sort of groundbreaking as a, as a, uh, as a strategy for um, you know, a public company like Coinbase. Uh, what's your take on what it's going to take on the regulatory side to act as that clean bridge into the DeFi ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, you see, because we we essentially act as a front end for a bunch of the volume that gets labeled as Uniswap. Um, you know, we 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 are as excited to see that growth and that development uh, as as much as anybody. And I think that um, you know the regulatory environment. Um, really offers, I think, some real challenges to that continued growth, which is one of the reasons why we're so focused on not only the baseline issues that we've been talking about in terms of um, uh, regulatory jurisdiction, uh, registration paths for central exchanges like ours, but also particularly outside the United States, making sure that new frameworks that are coming online, Mika in particular in Europe, uh, that, that are respecting um, the, the, the potential 
for, for uh, self-hosted wallets and other key elements, architectural elements of the DeFi uh, uh, infrastructure uh, to, to solve real problems for real people and create new opportunities uh, that haven't existed before. So for us, it's as much about um, creating le- regulatory clarity and certainty for the world as it exists today um, as, uh, 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 as much as it is looking ahead to you know where is where where are things likely to go and and we think we think that you know there's no question um, that uh, if, if the if the regulatory rules can uh, accommodate uh, a very different architecture for some of these products and services we still have a chance um, to, to realize our full potential and the US doesn't have to be left behind I think that's the most important thing to emphasize here we're seeing much more progress uh, outside the United States at present, but there is still time uh, for the U.S. to get this right. And, and then I, I know we spent some some time discussing some of the fundamentals w- within the, the DeFi ecosystem and uh, and uh, internet financial system, which I, I do like that term, Chris. Uh, I, but I do want to go back to Bitcoin because Bitcoin is where it all started. Uh, and I think that the macro case for Bitcoin has never been more compelling uh, Lynn, I, I'd love your thoughts on, you know, do, do you think that this is potentially the sort of tipping point for people understanding that Bitcoin deserves a slice in a broader portfolio? Uh, do you expect p- a potential sort of portfolio allocation shift um, from, you know, not just in individual investors, but from, you know, larger institutional investors? What, what do you make of, of, of how Bitcoin's responded well, so a number of different entities have reported uh, very large inflows during March, uh, you know, in response to the banking crisis. So on one hand, you know, the lower rates from, like, say, the two-year treasury, for example, like, you know, lower expectations of forward rates is beneficial for those types of assets. So you've seen kind of, you know, gold broke out a little bit, but obviously, you know, Bitcoin is, is much higher alpha. So that that um, received very large inflows. You know, I think during the prior this like prior bull cycle, there was a decent amount of institutional interest, and you saw a lot of high net worth interest. Uh, you know, pretty sophisticated buyers getting into the market, and you know, obviously that took a, a pause for a period of time. Uh, but yeah, I think that I think that as this market keeps persisting, as we see more and more cracks in the existing system, I think it does continue to serve as an advertisement for it. I, I think probably the bigger story is we have to think globally. I mean, you know, when we, when we describe what the global financial system looks like it's like you know there's 180 currencies roughly um you know a lot of them are pegged to the dollar or other things but there's you know there's all these like currencies and they're all these like local monopolies in their own jurisdiction so all the all of the cross-border trade is very high friction um and you see a lot of people around the world especially because most of these currencies don't hold up as well as the dollar as well as the euro you know as well as some of these others and so there's a ton of interest in Bitcoin, tons of interest in stable coins, basically all the different, you know, they, they, went, they gravitate towards the, these, you know, monies, uh, these harder monies. And, and of course, obviously there's different time frames. I mean, you know, Bitcoin is very volatile, but it's, it's been attractive for long-term holders. Um, stable coins have been very popular in these, in these very high inflation countries because, you know, they, they still might lose value slowly, but it's, it's less slow, it's less quickly than what's happening you know, with their own currencies. And so you see in Argentina, Lebanon, uh, Turkey, all these different countries, they, they pour into these types of assets. And so I, I think when it comes to a lot of people in the world, it doesn't, you know, it's more obvious to them. And I think in the West broadly, we've been very complacent with our the operation of our financial system. You, you, a lot of people don't see why they might need these technologies. But I think that over time, it's become more and more clear as we've had a pretty high inflation spike. And now we've had banking instability. I do think more and more people are looking into this and saying, you know, maybe this Bitcoin thing isn't crazy. Maybe it's, it's worth having a slice. I, I still think advisors are very under allocated. Um, but we are starting to see reports that even though their clients are going to them and saying, when are you going to you know, make it possible to have a Bitcoin slice? I want to hold some Bitcoin. Uh, so I think probably the next cycle will be pretty big for advisors. I think an ETF would be helpful in that regard. That's obviously been slow. We know we're, we're starting to see brokers um, offer you know, more direct Bitcoin exposure. Uh, but something like an ETF, you know, a spot ETF, is, is I think it, it's been proven in other countries that it's, it's fine. Um, and so I, I do think that there's still a lot of, you know, obvious low-hanging fruit for 
pools of capital that are either no exposure or very minimal exposure to go from zero to, to some. Very insightful. I, I, I think this is a great perhaps transition into want to ask each of you. We're about a fourth of the way through this year, which like in crypto terms, you know, we've gone through multiple market cycles in just a few months. Uh, but I, I just w would love, you know, we can maybe end on a more optimistic tone of you know, what would you like to see happen uh, through the end of this year? You know, what are you most excited about? What are you most hopeful for? Uh, Michael, maybe we can start with you. Certainly a, a spot Bitcoin ETF here in the US. I think Lynn just shared so articulately some of the driving motivations for why I'm now more than ever, uh, those who do not have a slice of Bitcoin in their portfolio may be thinking about it. Um, I'll say in a, in a less uh, smooth and, and slightly less articulate way, I can't think of a better advertisement for Bitcoin than, you know, recent events that have transpired or in and around um, the, the, you know, geopolitical and economic situation that we find ourselves in. And so when I think about increasing on ramps into this ecosystem, be it a spot ETF uh, for Bitcoin here in the US um, or the development of, you know, greater and fuller and fairer protections that bring investors into it, um, I am optimistic that, you know, not only is the asset class here to stay, um, but there are, you know, material inflows uh, bound for crypto overall and certainly Bitcoin being one of them. Just up and to the right, continuing to deepen and broaden these networks and to increase their usability and the engineering around them. We haven't talked about the Lightning Network yet, but that is the means by which 8 billion people in the world can create and transact in US dollars by simply downloading code to their smartphone. Uh, right now, uh, it's very, very small, but uh, it's just a matter of time. It's it's not it's 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 a when, not if, and it works very simply by collateralizing any fiat currency with satoshis, which is the the d division of of Bitcoin. You can transact in any fiat currency anywhere in the world, and uh, people will be voting with their feet. It doesn't matter ultimately what the regulators do. The code is ultimately what controls and how fast people choose to download it and use it. I'm optimistic that for all the uh, regulatory overreach we've seen here in the United States over the last 12 to 18 months, the U.S. courts are ultimately going to set us free. Um, we have the most um, robust legal system in the world. And um, I think in this moment, uh, it's going to require a robust legal response um, to rein in the regulators. That's the challenge. The opportunity, the thing that has me very optimistic is I believe our courts are up to that challenge. Yeah, so I guess I'll echo that a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about SEC, you know, is all about regulation by enforcement. And my response to that is, yes, their job is to enforce the law. They're a regulator. Uh, they're not here to make new laws. That's the job of Congress. So uh, what you said, Paul, and what you said, Jeremy, I think are pretty optimistic in terms of getting to more discourse and potentially more laws. Yeah, so, you know, I come at this um, like as a technologist principally, and um, I've never been more excited about the technological progress that's happening in, in blockchain infrastructure and wallet infrastructure and Ethereum, Ethereum layer twos you know, account abstraction, which is like a huge breakthrough. I don't think enough attention has been paid to it. And, and all of that for me, I, I, I analog, analyze the, anal, whatever the word is, <laughs> I compare it to other evolutions in the internet. And there was sort of the dial up to broadband moment. And there was the moving from PC browsers to mobile apps and, you know, sort of these fundamental lifts that took place in both UX and, and throughput. And I think we're going to hit those. Um, I think that um, the innovations in layer twos and account abstraction in particular as a framework for usability is going to mean that users are going to be able to download software-based wallets, transact directly natively without having to understand much, without having to go buy a crypto commodity in order to pay gas fees. They're going to be able to use stablecoins natively. 
uh, and, and have that be highly viral and bootstrapped with transactions that are, you know, a penny or two um, and with really delightful user experiences. All of that is coming in the next six to nine months. And so I am very optimistic that from a product market fit perspective, we're going to go well outside of the kind of crypto trading enthusiast crowd and into, as we already are, I mean, emerging markets are really leading the way here, but we're going to, we're going to see um, the kind of network utility and network effects uh, really start to take hold. And I think we're going to be well on our way into, you know, hundreds of millions uh, approaching a billion users by the end of 2024. So I I'm very optimistic about the technology right now. I think a lot of the things that we've needed are happening. And they're happening principally in the Ethereum um, community and the Ethereum Layer 2 community. Um, and so I'm, I'm quite bullish about that. I think I'm optimistic about this, the ongoing development of the space. I think it, it's, you know... It still takes more work to improve the user experience to bring it to uh, an increasingly mainstream audience. Right now, it's 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 currently been for a number of years where if people have frictions in the system they operate in, um, they are willing to you know go through the frictions of getting into the space. Uh, whereas, you know, if you look at, say, the, the chain analysis crypto adoption index, it's like 18 out of the 20 countries are, are developing countries um, because they have far more frictions in their, in their, you know, their existing system. And so they're willing to learn and, and, and more rapidly get into the space. And I think that as the hurdles continue to come down, while ironically some of the instability of the existing system continues to increase, um, then even people in these larger markets – uh, increasingly see the value uh, of getting into the space. And I'm, so I'm, I'm just pretty optimistic on the ongoing development, ease of use of getting people in, uh, and the value proposition being here to stay. Um, and, you know, people often, again, we go through the cycles of, you know, it's a bubble and then it's dead and then it's a bubble and it's dead. And I think, you know, this this last one was, you know, obviously the, the debt melting down, bad actors in the space. Uh, a lot of people thought it was dead. Uh, at least, you know, if they were outside of the space, a lot of them thought it was dead. And I think as it bounces back yet again, uh, it'll be a whole nother wave, a whole like a larger wave of people coming into the space to explore. Well, I'm going to come at it from the entrepreneurial um, and innovation side. And, you know, I think that the banking crisis we've just gone through is an incredible advertisement for how we need to update our financial system. And so I expect to see an influx of talent from that. We're already seeing and have been seeing an influx of uh, Web2 talent and traditional finance talent. Basically, the DeFi boom of 2020 and 2021 was a giant proof of concept of what can be done. And we're seeing, you know, built very senior um, entrepreneurs and builders come in to crypto to build better financial systems or to build, um, you know, a web to experience, but with a backend that respects the user and, and pulling from, say, some of the Silicon Valley or more polished um, pools of talent there. I would also say that within the internet financial system, I think we're going to see a lot of maturation in, in terms of integration with the traditional system, but also things like yield curves for the major assets along different durations, um, ability to mint stable coins against treasuries, some things that are going to pull in significant amounts of value and make um, blockchain based finance more palatable or even just accessible for, for the really at scale players um, that are playing in the tens of billions, hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars. Um, on the technological side, ETH L2s are coming together, Bitcoin L2s are coming together. Um, Solana is going to have a second client from Jump for stability. So the substrate is all improving. And I very much agree with Jeremy's comment that we're going from dial up to broadband and you needed broadband in order for there to be an explosion of users. And we're on that precipice with, with crypto. And then the last thing I would say is ETH on April 12th. So a week from when this is being recorded is going to go through a staking de-risking event and actually open up this idea of staking ETH as being risk minimized yield. Right now you only have 15% of ETH staked. A lot of its peers are 50 to 70% staked. And so I think that, um, you know, the only, one of the only markets that's bigger than gold is the treasuries market. And I think if Bitcoin's going after 
gold, then ETH might be going after the treasuries market uh, with risk minimized yield. And we're on the cusp of, um, say, one of the final transitions we need for that to be taken seriously. Well, there you go. Perfect way to wrap it up. Uh, that, that concludes the second edition of the Crypto Brainstorm. Uh, we're honored to have you guys as guests. I thought that was an amazing conversation. I hope the viewers uh, that are listening enjoyed the conversation. Uh, we will, uh, in, in the show notes, make sure to reference uh, where they can learn more about each of you. Uh, and, and with that, uh, I hope to talk soon. Yeah, right. thank you so much. Uh, as as Yasin said, we were honored to have you uh, for this particular moment in time because it is such a poignant moment in time, and you all uh, you all helped explain much more uh, how profound it really is. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. you. Bye bye. And of course, uh, we couldn't have done this without all of the hard work that uh, Yassine Almandra, our crypto lead, has put into pulling this panel together. Uh, it took quite a lot of time, and we're just so pleased at the caliber of the and, and the diversification of, of this panel. I think it made for a great discussion. Finally, I'd like to thank Michael Cromer and our marketing team for helping us pull this together. And uh, we look forward to doing this again. Thank you so much. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.